Hi, this is Bo Sanchez. Welcome to Kerygma TV. Today, we're going to continue to talk about how to break bad habits. And I know that this will be such a great help to you. If you are someone who wants to personally grow in your life in different areas, then keep on watching Kerygma TV. Seldom does a priest confess in public. I'm doing that for you now. Before I entered the seminary and the few first years in the seminary, I was very naughty. And we were required to pray four times a day. There are times where you have to wake up at 5 o'clock or 4.30, you go to chapel, you pray the rosary, you hear mass, you pray again, oh, pray, 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 pray always. I'm just asking myself, why? Why is this necessary? I love God. God loves me, period. I don't have to do this. Lately, I discovered the formators of priests, they thought of creating good habits to us that when you don't pray anymore, you feel fidgety. If there's something wrong, there's something lacking in you. Even if we go to feast, we go to mass, Sunday mass, there's like a wake-up call. Hey, I have to go to mass. It's Sunday. It's holiday of obligation. There is something in you that is disposes you to do that. Bad habits is the same. When you wallow in the quagmire of bad habits, ah, difficult to get out of that. What do you need to do? Convert yourself out of that. How do you do that? For new good habits. And as the Pope Francis says, it is the very existence that we have. I call that self-disposition. It's not what you are told, but what you're convinced to do. You must have your own who good of changing your lives, breaking the bad habits, so difficult. But once the good habits come in, it's also very difficult to break that. Pray to God every day and ask God and ask St. Michael to defend you from all the bad habits that exist in you and slowly break that up from the inside until you come up with a self-disposition. Jesus, you love me so much. You did so much for me. I'll do this for you to align myself with you. Ready for a word from God? All right, if you're ready, let's come in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, everybody stretch your hands out and say out loud, Today I receive all of God's love for me. Today I open myself to the unbounded, limitless, overflowing abundance of God's universe. Today I open myself to God's blessings, healing and miracles. Today I open myself to God's Word so that I become more like Jesus every day. Today I proclaim that I'm God's beloved. I'm God's servant. I'm God's powerful champion. And because I am blessed, I am blessing the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Here's God's message for all of us. Let His will be done. Let His will be done. Whose will? God's will. Not your wife's will or your boyfriend's will or your husband's will, but God's will, all right? We're gonna dive into a piece of story right now that's pretty exciting. I'm sure some of you may have heard this. It comes from the book of Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. You may or may not have heard this story, but it's a famous story about Jonah and the whale. How many of you are familiar? 
Jonah and the whale. It's a beautiful childhood story. This is a story that, that it was the original story before Pinocchio, that Disney cartoon character. Before Pinocchio was around, it was Jonah. Jonah spent three days in the belly of a whale. But I believe that one of the most beautiful lessons of Jonah is this. Jonah found his life to be in a mess because he ran away from God. How many of you can honestly relate to that? You ran away from God and now your life is in a mess. I believe that's all of us. Some of us here do that every week. You disobey God, you run away from His commandments, you run away from His instructions, and now everything is a mess. The thing that happened is that God disturbed, say disturbed. God disturbed Jonah. He wanted Jonah to do something big for him, to go to the city of Nineveh, but Jonah was too busy to be bothered. You know, so many of us, we always want God to lead our life, yes? Do you ever pray this prayer, God lead the way? guide me to where I need to go, I'll follow you. You ever pray those prayers? That's an amazing prayer. But here's the truth. You want God to direct you, but oftentimes, you don't allow Him to disrupt you. You don't allow Him to disturb you. If you really want God to lead your life, you're going to have to allow Him to disturb you. Because God's directions often come in the form of a disturbance. Say disturbance. God's going to need to disturb you. And I believe that one of the bravest prayers that you can ever pray is this. Lord, disturb me. It's easy to say right now, yes? But I can almost imagine that some of you are so scared to pray that prayer because if God would ever take you up on that offer, you're frightened that God is going to send you out to places that are unfamiliar to you, yes? But you got you to gotta think about that. God knows your limitations. You agree? So the grace of God will not guide you to places where He cannot guard you. You got to give God some credit. God's smart enough to know where to send you and where not to send you. I really believe that it's all about just knowing when God is tapping you. Tap, 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 tap the person beside you. You got to know when God is tapping you on the shoulder and in your heart because He wants you to do something very specific. But how do you do it? Ask me how. You got to be sensitive to the Spirit. Be sensitive to the Spirit. Let me give you an example that happened a few, few months ago. My wife and I, we were driving, going, going home. We were visiting our, her parents' house. They live somewhere in Quezon City. And in order to get out of the village, there's a steep uphill climb. It's fine if you're driving in a car. No effort. As we were passing through that road one night, she was driving. I was in, on the passenger. From the corner of our eyes, we see this man who was pushing an ice cream cart uphill. It took us only about five seconds to look at each other and realize that the Holy Spirit was tapping us. So what my wife did was she parked the car in the curb. I got out of the car, started to help that man. As soon as I got near him, I realized that he was actually an old man. He, could, he was old enough to be my grandfather. And so I started pushing that ice cream cart with him. At a certain point, I was almost out of breath because I felt like I was the only one pushing because he was so tired. You know, kulang na lang, sumakay siya dun sa cart. Kuya, gusto mo sumakay? I was pushing that, pushing that. When we got to the top, I was out of breath and I started thinking, what if we didn't stop for that man? He would have had to make that climb all by himself, you know? And I don't know what happened afterwards. You know, he thanked me, probably went home. I don't know if he told his wife, his kids, his neighbors about me and my wife helping him. But I believe that that night, we were the ones who came home blessed. That's what happens when you become sensitive to the Spirit. You're the one who's going to be blessed even more. But there's another part of that story. Because going home, we were passing through Commonwealth Avenue. I don't know if you've been there. Commonwealth is a long stretch. It was, it was hard for us to make a U-turn. All of a sudden, my wife says, you know, I regret the fact that I didn't buy everything on his ice cream cart because then he would, come, he would have come home with enough money. It was too late for us to turn around. Have you ever had moments like that when the Spirit is tapping you, but you're too busy? You got to ignore that. God, I got an appointment to keep this thing that I'm, I'm on schedule. It's so important. You cannot disturb me. And then all of a sudden, you feel this pang of pain and regret that you didn't help out. You didn't talk to that person. You didn't give your time. 
make yourself available for God to interrupt you this week. Just this week. Make yourself available so that God can bother you for something very specific that He wants you to do. Let His will be done in your life. Today, I'm going to answer this question that people ask me all the time. Brother Bo, how will I know God's will? Brother Bo, how do you discern uh, God's voice? How, how will you know Him? God, the, the, the voice I hear in my heart is God's voice. It might be the enemy's voice. How do you know? How do you know? I'm going to answer that question by telling you, by giving you an analogy. I've been married for 20 years now, going 21. And as I look back, I'm realizing, my gosh, my marriage is getting better and better and better every year. My marriage today is so much better than last year. And it's, it's true, and, and I believe that my marriage next year will be better than this year. Why? Two things, desire and time. Why desire? I, I desire to make her happy. I, you know, ever since we got married, I kind of like said, Oh, Lord, how will I make her happy today? <laughs> Every morning when I wake up, how do I make her happy today? I want to I wanna bless her today. I want to serve her today. It's, it's, like a, it's like a subconscious thing in my mind, you know, and, and I, I tried to make it subconscious, but obviously it had to be conscious first. And, 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 but but it's, it's time. It's like over time, I kind of like got to know her, like her love language. Hello, you know, there, there are things that I do that, that will make her smile. But there are other things that I'll do that will make her jump up for joy because I got to know her more. I got to know what makes her happy more. That's, and it took time. Same thing with God. I've been walking with God for 40 years. And so what has happened? Romans 12 verse 2 has happened. The renewal of my mind, which is my prayer for you, that as you attend the feast regularly, every Sunday, you know, uh, whoever is the preacher, <laughs> whether you, you, you just absorb the word every week and then every day open scripture, you know, dive into prayer, no matter how short, five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day, you know, just getting in, just getting saturated by the word and by prayer and by his presence. What happens? Keep desiring to do his will. Keep desiring to love God and serve God. And number two, in due time you will renew your mind. And this is what's going to happen. You're going to think the way God thinks. And you're going to see things the way God sees things. That's my prayer for you. Be blessed today. One of my biggest struggles and challenges as a leader, as a preacher, uh, as an entrepreneur, as a businessman is, I don't know if some of you can relate to this. I look young for my age. Do you agree? No. <laughs> Thank you, Gino, for saying the truth. I'm 40 years old, by the way. How many, how many of you have that same problem? You don't look your age. You look young. Uh, how many of you need to go to confession after raising your hands? <laughs> I always need to be compelled to tell people that, hey, I'm 40 years old. Every time I, I come to a, a speaking engagement, I got to tell them I'm 40 years old. Why? Because I believe that there's always older people. When older people are, are seated, are in the crowd, and they see a younger person speaking to them, you know the first thing on their head? What's this young man going to teach me something that I don't already know? What's this guy going to teach me something that I've never experienced before? And that's always been my struggle. So, I always want people knowing that, you know, I'm 40 years old. I'm proud of it. Um, but here's the truth that I've been carrying in my heart as a leader, and I believe that this is going to inspire some of our young leaders here, whether or not you feel frightened or insecure or afraid because God put you in a position and you're young. Here's the truth. When it comes to preaching God's Word, when it comes to serving God, period, age is not a requirement. It's not. Jeremiah was only 17 when God called him to minister to the people of Judah. David himself, King David, was anointed when he was a teenager to become a leader of Israel. And you don't even have to look in the Bible. You can just look at our, our very own leader, Brother Bo. 13 years old, he preached his very first message in that old garage in Kubao. So age is not a requirement. It's not a matter of age. It's a matter of anointing. Say anointing. It's a matter of anointing. When God anoints you, regardless of whatever age you have, 
He's going to be able to use you. It's just a matter of being available to God. And I believe that God's word, whenever we use his word, it's immutable, it's infallible, it doesn't change and it doesn't fail. So that's why, you know, I believe also that being 40 puts me in a very perfect age because I believe that I'm old enough to have acquired certain skills, certain wisdom, certain experience that I can share with people. But it also puts me in a place where I'm young enough I'm young enough to be able to relate to those under me. That's why the talk I'm going to be giving to you today is 40 years in the making. This is based on my own personal experiences. Did you know that the average person makes about 35,000 decisions every day? 35,000 decisions? How is that even possible? You're not counting. Because some of this, the decisions that you make, it's so automatic, say automatic. It's so automatic that you're not even thinking about it anymore. Like, for example, the moment you woke up this morning, did you have to ask yourself, should I brush my teeth today or should I not brush my teeth today? Should I go to the feast this Sunday or should I not go to the feast this Sunday? You know, some of these questions you don't even need to ask because you already need know the answer. But there are some decisions in life, big decisions, that are very important for you to think about. Like, for example, what career should I choose? What ministry should I serve in? Who should I marry? Guy number one, guy number two. What investment should I put my hard-earned money in? You know, who am I going to treat for lunch? This person on the left or this person on the right? You know, big decisions like that. And sometimes the decisions that you make, listen to this, the decisions that you make are very detrimental because it either takes you farther away from God's will or it brings you closer to God's will. That's why in the next few remaining minutes, I want to talk to you on how to make godly decisions. I'm going to be sharing with you two Bible stories. I believe we've already shared one. It's a story of Jonah. Jonah, who ran away from God's instruction and found his life in a mess. Here's the first thing, the first element that you need to know in making a good decision. Number one, intention. You need to ask yourself before making a decision, what is my intention behind this decision? Meaning, what is my motivation behind making this decision? Is it based on selfish reasons or is it born out of selflessness? Because the answer to that will determine the outcome of that particular decision. I believe that if you have the wrong intention, if you start out with the wrong intention, you will eventually have the wrong outcome. And that's what happened with Jonah. He started with the wrong intention, running away from God, selfish reasons, and he had the wrong outcome. We'll dive into that a little bit later, but let me share with you my own personal experience. When I was choosing my course in college, you still remember your college days? Yeah? When I was choosing my course in college, I only had one requirement. One big, solid, serious requirement. Would you like to know what my requirement was in choosing a course? Ask me what? A little bit louder, what? Kailangan walang math. So that was my only qualification. No math, please. Because during that time, third year, I had to choose a course. I was finished already with some of my academics except for one subject, which is obviously math. I was the record holder in my college, by the way. I held the record for being the student who took algebra four times. I'm proud of it. <laughs> four times. Two years. I had to finish that subject. So when I was choosing my course, I made sure this course doesn't seem like it has math. So the course that I chose was called Integrated Marketing Communications or IMC. Everybody say, wow. Yeah, wow. Sounds so deep, right? But it's all about broadcasting and advertising. And I'm, I was pretty sure that it had no math because creative people are right-brained. So we don't like math. If you're a left-brained person, you're analytical, you love math, okay? So anyway, first day of class. I was so excited coming into that first day of my major subject. Teacher comes in and then says, good morning, class. Today, you're going to need the subject for the, as a prerequisite for the next course that you're going to take next semester. And for this course, I will be teaching you marketing research. Wow, marketing research. What is marketing research? Well, it's the study of the market. How consumers buy their products, how often they buy their products, what behavioral patterns they use in buying those products. In other words, for this course, we are going to be using a lot of math. I go, Patay. Raised my hands. I go, Miss, can I go to the bathroom? Yeah. 
ran to the registrar's office, asked for a list of available courses because I was really serious in transferring courses because I absolutely do not like math. But I belonged, I, I studied in, a, in an economic school. So I was reading through the list. Economics, this surely has a lot of math. Scratch that. Business administration. This has a lot of statistics there. Accounting, most probably. Scratch that. Uh, entrepreneurial management. Sounds like a lot of math there too. Scratch that. Even education had math. The only thing that had no math was religious studies. Because <laughs> I believe that there was no math in religion, right? I ended up finishing my course, but you know, I never graduated. And this is where I give my disclaimer to all the young people who might still be studying. I hope that you don't use this as a vindication or as a justification for you not to finish your studies. This is my story. I have the mic. You learn from what I did, and I pray that God is going to use this, all right? I never finished my college. Why? Because I was deficient in three subjects. I could not pass three subjects. The first subject was math, obviously. I was stuck with calculus. I couldn't get, I can move, over, move on from calculus. The second subject was a class that required me to wake up at 5 a.m. every single Sunday. All the men here say amen. You know that, right? ROTC. The third subject, you will be shocked by this. The third subject I could not pass. I was so deficient in this subject. Theology. Religion. And yet here I stand waking up every Sunday at 5 a.m. to do what? To preach the word of the Lord to everybody here. This is proof to somebody who's sitting here right now who's thinking that just because you have some deficiencies, you're not going to be able to fulfill your destiny. Let me say this. Your deficiencies do not define you. Your deficiencies do not disqualify you from fulfilling your destiny. I mean, I'm the most unqualified person to stand here to preach to you. I never graduated from theology. And yet God is using me to preach the love of God every single Sunday. Because I believe that God has the power to qualify the unqualified. So even if you feel that you're unqualified, oh my gosh, God is going to qualify you. That's how God's grace works. It meets you where your limitations end. And so, you know, I never finished college, went on to start a business. That's what happens when you start earning, putting money in your pocket, right? You start working, start get, getting busy. And so I, I opened two businesses that were so successful. I started a retail outlet back in the time of the Nokia cell phones. You remember that? 5110, 3210. I opened shops to sell cellular phones. And I was so successful that I opened the service center two years later. But, you know, after three years... For whatever reason, I mismanaged both businesses, both retail outlets. I had to close them down. And then I had to close down my retail outlet, also my, my, app, my service center. After three years, and I realized it was because I lacked the accounting skills. I lacked the business know-how of how to operate the business. So what did I do? I started taking short courses in other schools just to feed me, feed my, my intellect, feed my, my mind. That was one of my biggest regrets in life that I started out with the wrong motive in choosing a course just because it had no math. I received the wrong outcome in life. Your decision should have the right motivation. Start out with the right motivation. Here's the second thing that you need to know in making a good decision. It's called infection. Say infection. Infection. Let's continue with the story of Jonah. The story of Jonah is that he rides this boat headed towards a different destination. And then all of a sudden, they encounter a storm. Say storm. They encounter a storm, and it is all because of Jonah. Let me read it. On verse 4, it says, Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. 
Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? You know, when Jonah made that decision, he wasn't thinking of us. He was thinking of me. He was thinking of myself. He was thinking about himself. And sometimes when you make decisions, sometimes the decisions that you make is only about you. You don't think about anybody else. Here's something that you can consider. When you make decisions, your decision should positively infect the next generation. Your decision should positively infect the next generation. I really put that word in positively because there's another way to infect people. It's negatively. That's what happened with Jonah. He wasn't thinking that there would be other people on the boat. No. He was only thinking of himself being on the boat. And that's also what happened to me. Continuing on with my story, I had no businesses, but I had life savings. So I could invest that money. One day, somebody comes up to me and says, bro, there's this investment firm, investment company that came up into the country, a Japanese company that deals with multi-level marketing. You're familiar with, familiar with networking? Open-minded ba kayo? Okay. So it was a networking program. And he said, if you join this company, you have to invest a big figure, an exact seven-digit figure, but do it for three months, that whole cycle, and you will receive 100 to 200 percent income back and so I was young I was foolish I said yes I was 26 years old at that time and you know that was about two months into the whole program and the money came back money came back but it wasn't hundred percent it was about 10 to 15 percent and the guy said it's because you didn't go through the entire three-month process you got to go through the entire three months and so I said okay let's do it again but because networking works best when you have more downlines under you right you understand Downlights. The more downlines you have, the better you can earn. So what I did was, what if I recruit another person, another investor, who would invest the same amount of money, a seven-digit figure, and I'll put him under me? That will earn me more money. And he said, yes, except for one condition. He said, are you going to guarantee me? And I said, yeah, because my money went back. So yeah, I'm going to guarantee you. So we dove in, put all our money in one basket. You know, even before the three months had ended, even before two months had passed, we kept on hearing news that the company was no longer releasing the commission. Products were no longer being sent out. And so we go to the office somewhere here in, in, in Pasay, and the entire company was closed. Everything went down from there. I was not only bankrupt for my life savings, but I owed another person. But I paid him back. I was a man of my word. I paid him back. But how was I able to pay, to pay him back? I borrowed the money. But because I was young, I had no credit in the bank. The only people who would lend somebody as young as me were loan sharks and financiers. For 5 to 10%, I borrowed money. And for one year, I tell you, it was the most horrific year of my life. I was waking up every day, getting out of bed, for what purpose? Just to get more money to be able to pay off the supplier, this financier. Wake up again the next day, look for more money to pay off that supplier and that supplier and that supplier. By the time that entire year ended, the amount that I started with blew up to as high as 7 million. And I was 26 years old. Nobody knew a thing that was happening in my life. Not my mom, not my sister, not my brother. And so I said to myself, this, is, this has to stop. Because it's no longer living. I mean, it's just living off of one check to another just to survive off of paying the interest. And so I gave myself two ultimatums. I said to myself, it's either I borrow the money from someone who has the capacity to, to lend me without any interest or very little interest. That's what you want to do, by the way. If you have debt in your life, you want to borrow very little interest or no interest at all. And then you focus on paying that loan, paying that, 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 that debt. I knew somebody. She happened to be the sister of my mom. But then the other option for me was to run away, just like Jonah, run away to the U.S. I had 500000 in my bank account that wasn't even mine. 
But I was ready to run away. I had my passport in my backpack the entire week that week. And finally, I, I had that appointment with my tita. We sat down and I told her everything that had happened. And she was just poker faced, listening to me, really lending an ear. And at the end of that whole conversation, she says to me, Okay, I'll call you tomorrow. And so I felt like there was this 50% chance that I was going to be helped. It was a miracle from God happening right before my eyes. And so I got home, did my business, went to bed, went to sleep. And then at 5 a.m. the next morning, I wake up to the image. At the foot of my bed was my mom in tears. And all she kept on saying again and again was, Anak, but hindi mo sinabi. Why did you not tell me? So you know what happened, right? My tita told my mom. So I didn't have the chance to get mad, but but hindi mo sinabi. Why did you not tell me? And then she started crying. I started crying. We started hugging each other, and then we both fell asleep. And, and when we woke up, you know, we, we had a chance to speak in the in the breakfast table, and I was telling her this is what happened. I was so foolish. I was so risk risky. But I, I I don't know what to do. And then my mom looks into my eyes and says. Okay, I'll help you. But I, wanna, I want you to promise me one thing. That every money that I will give to you, you will need to pay me back. Because you need to be responsible for what you did. But the truth of the matter is that during that time, my mom was also financially down. Because my dad had recently just passed away two years ago from, the battle, from a battle with emphysema. A lung disease that really siphoned our financial stability. You know how diseases affect you, right? It really, it really damages your savings. And so my mom was also financially down. But after four weeks, something like that, four or five weeks into that whole thing, my mom comes up to me and says, Anak, I now have the money. Go call your suppliers and your financiers and tell them that you're going to pay them back. You're going to issue a check that will no longer bounce. And I did. But I never knew where the money came from. Until one day, I started to realize that we were no longer going to our old house in Taitai. We, we lived in Taitai, but we were staying in a townhouse in Quezon City. My mom sold the house just to be able to pay off my debt. That's why I really want to honor every parent here, every mother, every father, for everything that you do for your children, for how much sacrifice you give to your children, because it's really, you really are a gift from the Lord. But you know, remembering what Jonah did that day, I, I can honestly relate to him. How when I made that decision to, to, to decide something based on myself, on my selfishness, I never considered my family. I never considered my siblings. I was only thinking of myself. When you make decisions in life, especially the big ones, you got to take into consideration your future family if you're single, your future wife, your future children. But that's one big lesson that I want to share with you today that whenever you make decisions in life, make sure you consider others, the people around you because they get affected by it. It's a ripple effect that happens. Infection. Here's the third thing you need to learn to make a good decision. Intersection. Say intersection. Intersection. To preach this, I'm going to use another story, the story of Paul. You all know Paul, right? Paul who used to be Saul, who persecuted the church. But now he's Paul who was for the church. But Paul catches himself at a time when the, the church was now persecuting him because he was preaching against. He was preaching for Jesus and they didn't like that. So now they grabbed him as a, as a prisoner and he was now also on a boat, just like Jonah. But the difference is that he wasn't disobeying God. He was actually following God's mission. He was following God's instruction. And sometimes that'll happen to you that when your decisions are, are, are godly decisions, sometimes it's going to put you in harm's way. But trust God that if it's the right decision, God's going to pull through. God's going to follow through for you. Here's one thing that you need to know, all right? When you make decisions in life, your decision should always intersect, intersect with your godly mission. It should be aligned with your godly mission. Let me share with you real quick. My mission this year 
I said to God, Lord, this year, this year is about me growing your gift, the one that you gave me to preach to people. So I want to be sent out, not just here in PICC, but other parts. I've gone to Tagaytay, Bulacan, different parts in, in, in countries, in, in our country. But you know, it requires resources. And I used to drive a car, a, a sedan, that required unleaded. So this year, I, said, I, I prayed to the Lord, Lord, I want an SUV, diesel. But I have a budget, a very small budget. You, you all know how SUVs cost, right? They cost an arm and a leg. So I really had a small budget. So my wife and I, when we were computing our budget, it, we couldn't afford an SUV. And so we kept on praying to the Lord, Lord, if you really want this for us, this is going to align with my mission. And you know, one day, God comes up with a solution. We heard news that one of the car manufacturers, which wasn't our first choice, by the way, they were giving a huge discount. And it, we could afford it. So we said, okay, let's file for the loan. We filed for the loan and we said, if God, is gonna, if, if God is gonna answer our prayer, He's gonna make sure that the loan is approved. The next day, I go to a bank, which I don't usually do, and then I sit in one of the corners. You know how in a bank they would have loose newspapers because people would read it and throw that, that piece of paper? It was one piece of paper on one chair that was available and I sat down and I saw that page, motoring section. I was reading through that page and oh my gosh the exact brand and the exact model that we wanted was right there and it said on that piece of paper huge discounts because this year they're gonna launch a new model so they're giving a huge discount for that brand and so I started computing I started getting excited and would you know that when I saw the monthly payments that I would make every month it's not really that big it's very small it was the exact amount that we were praying for. God delivered that car December 24, right before the birthday of Jesus. Your decision should always intersect with God's mission for your life. Can I put both stories together? Jonah who was in a boat, and because he was in the boat, he encountered, they encountered a storm because he was the problem on that boat. But there's another character that we've talked about. What was his name? Paul who was also in the boat. And they also encountered a storm. But this time it was different because instead of almost killing everybody on the boat, just like Jonah, Paul ended up saving everybody on the boat because he was there. Now I want you to ask yourself this question. It's, it's really a thought that you can take home because the truth is right now you're in a boat. You're in a family boat. You're in a ministry boat. You're in your company's boat. You are in this community's boat. I want you to think about this question. Is the boat that you're on right now, is it better or worse because you're in it? In other words, are you Jonah in this boat? Are you the burden in that boat? Or are you like Paul? who is the blessing in that boat. Because there's really no way go to get around that. Um, let me preach this in Tagalog. It sounds so much better. I was putting myself in that position of Jonah and, and, and Paul. And if I happened to be the, the person in that boat, I would probably ask Jonah, Bakit ka kasi nandyan? Ba't ka kasi nandyan? Wouldn't you ask that? Ba't ka kasi nandyan? Kung hindi ka nandyan, hindi sana gumulo ang buhay ko. Bakit ka kasi nandyan? I want to challenge you to become the kind of person, the kind of Christ follower, the kind of disciple that when people see you, they'll say, Buti na lang nandiyan ka. Thank God you're there. If it weren't for you, things might have gotten messed up. Instead of saying, why are you here? You shouldn't be here. No, thank God that you're here. Can you tell the person beside you, Buti na lang na ka? And here's really the thing that I wanted to preach to you. The greatest decision that you can ever make is to have Jesus in your life. Because you know that when Jesus is in your life, no matter what things you decide, God can use that. God can turn it around and God can use it for His good. God, that's what the Bible says. God works all things, all things, for the good. Amen?
Ako si Kaloy Dimson, ang uh, operations head ng Anuim. Ako po ay uh, uh, umpisang naglingkod dito sa Anuim 2007. Napunta ako dito sa Anuim because uh, one time yung nurse ng Anuim naghahanap ng social worker. Uh, ako ay isang social work graduate. It's a big blessing na sinabi niya, ate kung gusto mo mag-social uh, work, pwede kang mag-apply. Kup-kup ko ako ng pare. At ako po ay patulong-tulong lang po doon hanggang sa ako ay nai-refer dito dahil na-find out nila talagang orban ako. Nung napunta po ako dito sa Anawin, na-upset po ako tsaka na-depress. Pero sa pagtagal-tagal ko po dito, naisip ko na ba't ako madi-depress, ba't ako ma-upset. Instead, it's a big blessing for me and I'm really very grateful that we have Anna Wynn. Hinala ko ang kapatid ko umatwi dito sa Anna Wynn. Wala akong naramdaman na natakot ko sa iyo naman dito. Hindi na ako nagsisipak ng gawin, hindi ako nangangako. Hindi na ako nagluluto. Dito, kakain ka na lang. maglikod sa ating matatanda, hindi yan basta-basta lang kasi kailangan ng mahabang pangunawa pa siya because we all know naman na ang mga lola dito ay they are abandoned and rejected by their families na talagang sila may mabibigat sa kanilang dibdib na nandito kami para yung mga bigat nila ay through communication, pinapapil namin na love namin sila at still sila ay importante pa dito sa mundo. Maraming mga challenges bilang isang mamahala. Una ito yung funding. Without fund, talagang hindi mo ma-push kung ano yung gusto mong proyekto na gagawin. Hindi rin maganda ang pag-aalaga kapag uh, walang pondo. Pinagdadasal po po lahat yun. Yung mga board of trustees, yung mga management and staff, pahabain niyo pa po ang buhay nila. Gabi ko. It's not because of anything else. I'm really very grateful there is Anna Wynn. Kasi pag may nagpumunta ng tumutulong sa'yo, so, pinapupunta ka na dito, siyempre mapapasalamat ako sa mga tumutulong sa mga. Sa lahat ng mga donors na nagbibigay ng kanilang blessing dito sa Anawim, kami po ito ang gusto nagpapasalamat at uh, ito ay malaking biyaya na aming natatanggap. Your support, your help financially or in kind, grabe, maraming mapupuntahan, maraming masisiyahan. And yung aming pagtulong sa mga elderly ay ma-extend pa, dadami pa, dadami pang mga elderly ang matutulungan because of you. To all the donors and sponsors of, uh, and benefactors of Anogin, thank you so much for everything. And I hope you'll continue all the blessings you are giving us. And I thank God for all of you. Especially, thank you for all the love. Maraming salamat po sa tumutulong. Thank you for the love. God bless and thank you for the love. Thank you for the love. I want to thank you that because of your partnership, I don't feel alone. You know, it can be lonely doing God's work, but because of you, because of the partners that we have in Kerygma TV, we're able to do this. We're able to bless so many people. I really want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. For those of you who want to partner, want to help out in the ministry, I just want to give a say, just want to say thank you, you know, with, with this, the, the first talk of our series. Uh, send it to you for any amount that you want to help this ministry. And, and if you wish to give 2,000 pesos or more, I will not only give you one, but the entire series of Breaking Bad Habits. Just bless you with that. Plus, 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 plus my book that has helped already thousands upon thousands of people stop hidden addictions. This is going to be a game changer for many people. And I want to give this Put this book in your hands and you can share it to your family. You can share it to your friends uh, for a gift of 2,000 pesos or more. This whole series plus this book. Uh, contact details are on the screen and uh, just tell us that um, you want to help. Thank you. Thank you so much for your love, friendship and generosity.
What a word, what a powerful word. Let's respond in prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I want you to open your heart right now. Just, just let the word of God be so powerful it will change the, the trajectory of your destiny. Let's, let's do that. Let's say, Jesus, I give you permission. Just say that. I give you permission to be my king, to be my Lord, to be the one who will bless me. And, and I will follow you all the days of my life. Just say that. Just say, I will follow you in every area of my life. And I pray for your freedom. I also pray for every need that you have, that God be your food, that God be your water and your drink, that God be your comfort, that God be your conviction, that God be your health, that God be your supply. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, thank you for joining us in Kerygma TV. This is Bo Sanchez saying live a fantastic life.